Want to be a part of the conversation? Then let us know on the TNT Radio interactive live chat room at tntradio.live. Lighting the fuse for freedom. Today's news talk, TNT Radio. Live from London with Sonia Poulton on today's news talk, TNT. And we're back and Janie has got you talking. Of course, it's an incredibly emotive subject, voluntary assisted dying. I mean, it just is, isn't it? Let me read you some of the comments. Red said, would an ending in poverty and destitution be considered good reasons to call it a day? And this is the thing, is that there is a great deal of concern. Obviously, there are all these variables. But I have to say, from my position, my position pretty much is I would like to be given that choice. I don't want anybody else to make that choice for me. And I would have deep concerns about what we are hearing in Canada, although Janie was quick to say no, that they've kind of been given a bad rap. But I don't know. Eleanor says, but we're already seeing euthanasia being weaponized against vulnerable people. For example, like in Canada, where people who've had a bad back or can't afford rent are asked to commit assisted suicide when they're already suffering from low confidence and abandonment. Bad back can be fixed. Rent can be paid. What's next? They will never make it fair or authentically coming from a suffering person. And of course, there are many issues concerning this. I mean, there's no getting around it, obviously. But I I do have problems with families being criminalized when they are trying to help a suffering member of their family. So I suspect that this is a conversation that we need to keep having. And uh, at the moment, I feel that a lot of the conversation has been very much from the assisted assisted dying perspective, because obviously when you have celebrities and personalities like Esther Ranson, who seem to be completely pro it, and then getting on board people like Sakia Starmer, it takes it into a different dimension. But people need to be able to speak out and speak up and say, actually, we have great concerns that so-called useless eaters will just be, you know, say, oh, okay, well, let's get rid of them. That, you know, that, that's a problem. Let's, you know, and, and do that. So, This is a conversation we need to continue keep having. And the thing about me, as you will know, is I believe that for the most part, no no conversation should be taboo. We should be talking about things. If you don't talk about things, you push them underground and heck, we all know what happens then. Things that they'll always come out in a way and never usually positive. You have to be able to converse about something. Now, look on that topic. Let's have a look at some of the headlines. This one has caught my attention today. It's to do with Assange and the US Justice Department. They've reportedly been in conversation for a period of time with Assange's legal team. Preliminary talks have been taking place. They're looking for a plea deal, which would mean that Assange would not need to be extradited. It's something that could be done remotely. And uh, I think that's interesting. It would essentially be reduced to a lesser charge of mishandling classified information. And uh, an attorney representing Assange said that uh, legal departments have not seen any indication that his legal department rather have not seen any indication that the Justice Department intends to resolve the case. So is this just political behaviour? Who knows? But I tend to think that anything that could reduce what Julian Assange is facing is better than nothing, because obviously they're determined to get him one way or another. So we will see how that develops. I think that personally is very interesting. And also, Gemma was talking yesterday about HMRC and how they're shutting the phone lines. Well, (laughs) lo and behold, they then made an announcement where they actually humiliatingly were forced to drop those plans after Jeremy Hunt intervened, said they'll be halting those plans admitting more needs to be done to convince the public they are a good idea and that's the key there right so then these plans aren't done with they just need to do better PR work because we have people like our Gemma who raises awareness of what's really going on I think one of the comments yesterday about Gemma was Gemma is the resistance and indeed she is now talking about craziness did anybody of course you didn't because you've got some discernment but I was um, I was tagged in this tweet to do with the Jeremy Vine show. The Jeremy Vine, of course, one of the biggest pro lockdown, pro jab proponents out there during COVID. I used to work with Jeremy. I contributed to his show for a good ten years. We only fell out because I refused to accept that people can be born in the wrong body, and Jeremy had jumped on this whole gender idea. 
And uh, so we fell out over that. And uh, but one of the things that he said yesterday, I, I think it was yesterday, but but it's a it's a it's a recent clip. And uh, his actual quote was, this might sound crazy, but China does it. We've got to take control of Twitter and shut it down for the time being. And thankfully, Jenny Kleeman, a journalist, fought back and said, no, no, that isn't the solution. You don't shut down Twitter. And this is the thing with people like Jeremy Vine. Right. The man is a control freak. We know that. Do you remember that? infamous quote where he sort of um, uh, allowed this idea of what are we to do with people who refuse to be jabbed during COVID? And he was like, well, you know, I mean, what are the, what are the sort of choices? I'm paraphrasing him, but this was the gist of it. What are the choices? We either hold them down. No, you don't hold them down. You don't hold anybody down. Jeremy Vine, frankly, I did a a, a video about him, about him being a gatekeeper. He is, in my opinion, and we're still allowed opinions, an absolute danger to society half the time. Got to be careful with Jeremy Vine, though, because he's very litigious, as we all know. And uh, what else? Oh, just to say, just to harp back very, very briefly to this whole Kate story. I love the way that they're framing it in the Daily Mail. Rebecca English, a royal reporter, absolutely in with the royal family. And she said, it's been so heartbreaking for William to see Kate's reputation trashed in the same way as Diana's. Nobody's been trashing Kate's reputation. That's absolutely farcical for her to even suggest that. But again, you can see the way the wind is blowing on this story. And on that note, I'm going to bring Gemma back in for some more UK headlines. It's the stuff. It's that division people are talking about. And that cluelessness that they want to push. Today's News Talk Radio, TNT. Oh, all my birthdays have come up once. I now get Gemma twice a day. How thrilling. Lovely to have you back with us, Gemma. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's great. And to our show, I think it really does suit the, 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 your style and, and the breadth now of subjects that you're able to cover. So, yeah, no, it's good. I mean, this is our job, isn't it, to bring a, a, a whole cross section of what's happening in the news to, to people around the world. And great, you know, if, if you're listening, hope the UK news is relevant. But the Kate stuff, you know, the narrative has shifted almost overnight hasn't it? That, that's what I couldn't get over this morning in the UK, the perusal over the headlines. It's like, it's so controlled now, so controlled. And I really do believe that's because the mainstream, were, there were a few people, there was a BBC reporter, wasn't there, who, uh, who questioned the validity of the image of Kate at the farm shop and said, it's obviously not her. She tweeted that. And then it, that was quickly taken down. Uh, you can't have a BBC reporter questioning the narrative. Um, and all the mainstream were beginning to question the narrative and questioning the palace today silence and like you said oh isn't it awful it's just like diana again stage managed completely managed uh what's the truth of this who who knows who knows but even we got sucked into it we got sucked into it for a reason so there's clearly something afoot this story will be back it will be back it's, oh yes it will be back yeah yeah so anyway um i have a few other headlines most of which we touched on in the last hour but i think the top story that we can discuss now does very much link into the theme of uh, assisted dying uh, actually in terms of the population control and the the cost of an aging population. Uh, this is because this long awaited report into potential injustices into millions of women, a generation of women in the UK is due out today. It's the second and third installment of a report by the government ombudsman. Uh, campaigners are saying that women born in the 1950s were affected by an increase in retirement age, which they say they weren't told about properly. And it affected millions of women, leaving them destitute in poverty, unable to find work because they thought they could retire earlier than men, but a law was passed saying that they couldn't. We'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, the Rwanda bill, the ever-present Rwanda ping-pong, continues between the British House of Lords and House of Commons. The House of Lords last night again voted down the proposals, made seven more changes, which they've now passed back to the House of Commons today to vote on. This is going to go on and on. It's going to cost us even more money uh, and no final resolution, even though Rishi was saying they'll be on the planes by the spring. Well, we're in the spring. Uh, it's never going to happen, never going to happen. Uh, the UK Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, is meeting with the Australian PM, Anthony Albanese, today as part of the annual Australia-UK meetup. It comes a day after the UK Defence Secretary and the Australian Defence Minister signed an historic agreement strengthening defence ties between the two countries. And it does look as well like it's set for a general election in the autumn. Uh, one minister today, senior minister, has been speaking out saying, you can't just call an election in the spring. You have to waiting for times to be right or because there's a particular mood. It's definitely an autumn time frame that we're now looking at, which means, Sonia, that after the 
the Easter recess, we will see campaigning stepping up a thousand percent. And there'll be a lot of stories from all sides of the political spectrum that we'll be covering here on TNT. But it's that top story about the pensions, I think, which very much links into uh, the theme of assisted dying. We've got an aging population that the government has to pay for. They don't want to pay for it. And so isn't it funny? Suddenly we're seeing themes of assisted dying everywhere in the UK media. Uh, But it's one to discuss, certainly. It is one to discuss. I feel that poor Waspy women have just been so badly let down and so little attention paid to that campaign comparatively compared to obviously other campaigns that exist. And it's almost like they've just been forgotten. It's just like, so what? It's, it, it is horrendous. The unfairness of it is actually quite shocking. Break it down for us, Gemma. Well, basically, this all stems back to a a law that was passed way back in the 1990s, actually, uh, 1995. A law was passed by the UK government saying they were going to um, bring in uh, the retirement age uh, of parity from the age 60 for women was was UK retirement age at that point and 65 for men. So in 1995, the government said, look, we we are going to raise it. We're going to bring it in line because we can't afford the burden on the state purse for the state pension. So this is the pension that everyone in the UK gets once they reach a certain age. It's nothing to do with your own private pension that you might have in the workplace. So then they said, we're going to bring it in the parity probably between 2010 and 2020, but more near to 2020. Um, And then the coalition government in 2011 shifted the goalposts and brought it in earlier. So women's retirement ages went up from 60 to 65. And they say the women are saying the WASPies, the Women Against State Pension Inequality, said they weren't communicated that change quickly enough to make provision. So you had an entire generation of women born in the 1950s, millions of them, giving up their jobs at 60, going to claim their state pension and being told, no, the law's been changed. You can't get it till you're 65. And they're like, what? That, well, nobody told us. And the government said it did communicate the message, uh, but this is where the report has come in. So it's the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman who's already published the first findings, um, saying that the changes, and they were very critical of the government. They said, no, the changes weren't brought in uh, with, with enough information for women, the women weren't told properly, a women had left the workforce, and then they couldn't get back into the workforce because they were 60. So, I mean, 60-year-old women are not in demand in the workforce. A generation was plunged into poverty. Since then, this is the interesting bit, the retirement age is now 66 for women and men due to rise to 67 between 2026 and 2028. Clearly, the government doesn't want to pay any pension to anybody. I think this is a very clear message here because they haven't got the money. We have an aging population and we have a younger workforce uh, and there's not enough of them to contribute to pay for the generation above them. And the government does know this, which is why I think it's very interesting the theme of assisted dying coming out. Anyway, campaigners are eagerly waiting with the WASPy campaigners for the second and third instalments of the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman uh, report today. They can't recommend lawfully compensation, but they can recommend one-off payments to women. Uh, and that that happens in the report, this could land the government with billions and billions of pounds that they have to pay out for not communicating these changes sooner. I really feel for the women. I think this is a part of an ongoing war against women, actually, that we talk about in relation to the trans agenda. Uh, I think if this was a generation of men, I don't want to be too controversial, but I think the government might have been a bit more uh, on point with its messaging. And I think it thought, oh, it's only a load of old women. They won't listen. They won't care. They've still got their husbands, husbands to support them at that age. Age. But it's not the case, you know, women get divorced now, there are second marriages all around. Um, and the women, they came back fighting and the WASPy group are to be commended for this. But we don't know what the report's going to say yet. It might just say nothing to see here, no compensation, no payouts necessary. We'll have to see. But it is a long awaited report into what some are saying is a real miscarriage of, of justice, actually. I I agree. I believe it is a miscarriage of justice. This, of course, was all part of David Cameron and George Osborne's uh, fake um, ideological austerity programme in which they clamped down. They wanted to reduce the benefit um, burden on the country. And I think it is absolutely obscene to attack pensions because we're talking about people who have put into the system right they've worked they've they've paid their way and suddenly they're being denied that opportunity of being taken care of a little bit and let's face it better the, the the amount that people get on pensions state pensions is not great you're not going to get a life of luxury but they've made it even harder for people so it's fairly obscene the fact that david cameron of course has come back round again every time i look at him now Gemma, all i think about is his attacks on sick and disabled people the elderly and i think 
think you can. I, that, there's that famous expression, obviously, isn't there, where you can tell a lot about a nation, the way that they treat their elderly and vulnerable people. And I think that's what it says here. I do believe it's an attack on women. I do have to say that I think if this was an attack on men's pensions, people would be more up in arms. And that's what I say comparatively. We've heard very, very little about it. But I hope that uh, that the right thing is done. Again, personally, as a taxpayer, Gemma, I am more than happy to take care of people who've already contributed to our country. And I think that that is what we should do. That is what society should do. So let us hope they get what they need from this report. But yeah, I think it's really unfair, an absolute attack on them. So uh, Gemma, thank you as ever for bringing the headlines to us. This is Gemma. She's been with us for a second time on Thursday and she will be with us for two times tomorrow as well, which is fantastic. Something for you all to look forward to. I'll be right back. TNT's James Freeman. Now that I'm sitting on the other side of the fence, I see the budget in a very different light. Um, I find the discussions and leaks in the press in the weeks running up to the budget totally patronising. You know, will he, won't he give us some tax cuts? Um, when the reality is that nothing in the budget will make any material difference to anyone, pretty much. Um, that's usually the story. Um, it is a game of musical chairs where the government Government giveth with one hand and taketh with the other. And we're all reminded about how little money that we've got left in our pockets. James Freeman on today's News Talk TNT. This is generally the view of people, oh, we don't know much about Assange. Well, you should know, because whether you know it or not, he is fighting for you. For your courage and leadership and tenacity in journalism and publishing. Since 2010, Assange has been held in progressively narrower, darker, colder, and crueler spaces. He has been detained since the 7th of December 2010 in one form or another. And we are now here after years of imprisonment. WikiLeaks is a non-state hostile intelligence service. I think the man is a high-tech terrorist. A high-tech terrorist. A traitor, a treasonous. He has to answer for what he has done. Assange faces up to 175 years in prison for publishing classified documents exposing U.S. war crimes. The U.S. government narrative about Julian is a complete fraud. It is a complete fraud from A to Z. Julian took on the most powerful countries in the world, basically all of them. We now have confirmed that there were plans to kidnap Julian here in the center of London, or even assassinate him. No one who instigated that illegal and immoral war has been brought to justice. But the great truth teller sits behind bars. If wars can be started by lies, peace can be started by truth. Julian Assange is a hero. What if everything we thought we knew about somebody was a lie? Would we be willing to go on a new journey of understanding? This is a story of deception, lies, bravery, and a man who risked everything to bring the truth to light. Mr. Assange shows all the symptoms that are typical for a person that has been exposed to psychological torture over a prolonged period of time. He looked at me intensely and said, I hate to say this. He then hesitated, visibly troubled and searching for words. And then he finally said, please, save my life. May future generations have the ability to speak without restraint. May our children and their children know truth and have access to information that leads to justice. Wherever Julian goes, free speech goes with him. If there is a bird that is about to take flight, stretch her wings and rule the skies, may it be a peace star and no longer a bald eagle. If you think Assange is a traitor, he's a rapist, he's a narcissist, he's a hacker. I don't blame you because you have been deceived. And if you think you've not been deceived, that's normal because otherwise it wouldn't be deception.
mind is like a computer. No matter how efficient it may be, its reliability is only as great as the information fed into it. That's a campaign promise. Tell us the truth. Tell us the truth. We mandate that the truth be told. You're hearing it. TNT. Brilliant. Thank you so much. These are so many messages that have just been said in response to what Gemma and I have just been talking about. I have to read them. It's not just us 50s women. It's still rising. Uh, some of you will be 75 before state pension. It's already going up to 70. Yes, absolutely. It's a diabolical disgrace, Gem, says Mazzy. Um, and, and intruder, I take your point. Can men be compensated for having been discriminated against for so long? Re-retirement age. That is a fair point, intruder. And, uh, and he said men's retirement age went up as well, but no one gives a about them. Well, I do. So, and I did, as I say, I take your point, you know, it's, Balance it up. Um, and uh, just a bloke says, if the depopulation agenda succeeds, there'll be no one left to pay the pensions. Well, that's a bit of a sobering thought, if uh, true. Um, and uh, loving your program, says Helen. That's not lovely Helen who I met the other week, is it? And then met at Jam for Freedom before. If it is, she is absolutely glorious, as indeed are you all. I'm very... I'm very honoured and fortunate to have incredible people who support and follow my work. And uh, right, let me bring in somebody whom I admire. And uh, she is a journalist. She, from her own words, she she covers world affairs from an on the ground perspective, and she does. And one of the reasons that I admire Vanessa Beely, for that is who it is, is because she puts her money where her mouth is. She literally gets out there. She's not hiding behind a desk and doing her work. She is there on the front line, as it were. Welcome, Vanessa. Lovely to have you with us today. No, oh, thank you, Sonia. That's so kind of you. No, it's true. It's absolutely true. You are probably one of the most uh, trolled journalists around. <laughs> and uh, yes, you are. We know that. Absolutely. <laughs> and none more so than in recent times, obviously, since the whole October the 7th, which you and I know it didn't all start on October the 7th. But since October the 7th, I've seen you hugely trolled, but you persist, which is absolutely great. And obviously, a huge focus of your work is what has been happening in the Middle East. And you cover it with, with absolute clarity. <clears throat> and we wanted you to comment on some stories as they relate to the UK regarding the Middle least regarding Israel. And one of them is this news that, and I was completely unaware of this, and I don't know how many people are aware of this, but it's it's been revealed how we Brits, us poor beleaguered taxpayers, are spending up to 19 million to protect Israeli ships in the Red Sea. Is that actually happening? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, this the, the history between Britain and Yemen, of course, goes back um, more than a century because uh, Aden in the south of Yemen was effectively a British colony from 1839 until 1967. Britain has special forces on the ground in Yemen. A lot of people will not be aware of that. In 2015, under uh, Theresa May's government, um, when the war against Yemen started, and by the way, it didn't need to start at all. Jamal Ben Omar, who was the um, UN envoy at the time, told the UN that Yemen has uh, a political resolution. Uh, it's forming a coalition government. And a few days later, Saudi Arabia launched its aggression and blockade of uh, millions of Yemeni people supported, of course, by the British, um, who support the, the, the uh, fugitive president that had already basically outrun his GCC uh, mandate and had fled the country, having resigned. Um, and so Britain in, in 2015 sold almost three billion worth of weapons to Saudi Arabia to bomb Yemen. BAE at the time, Philip May, who of course was the husband of Theresa May, was working for an, a, a company called Capital Group that was a major shareholder in BAE. And guess who had record profit, profit since 2015? BAE on the sale of weapons. So, you know, this is, this is a, a, a constant money laundering program that's feeding money back into the military industrial complex in Britain. And, and the bombing of Yemen now, 
even Britain's involvement in the war in Yemen against Yemen since 2015 is without any mandate. It's without parliamentary mandate and it's without a public mandate yet again. It's actually shocking. Kenny McCaskill, who's a MP for Alba, he said, and I quote him, there's always money to wage war abroad and never funds to fight poverty at home. Never a truer word has been said, right? <laughs> Listen, <laughs> let us just park there a second. Let's go to some news headlines and we will be right back with Vanessa Beely. Here we go again. All right, let's go. go. Yes. TNT Radio News. Matt Boyland here with your TNT headlines. The first human to have one of Elon Musk's Neuralink computer chips surgically implanted in their brain has shown the world just how the tech works. Israel is reportedly arresting local journalists in Gaza to hide the brutality of its latest raid on the Al Shifa hospital. And there are encouraging reports that the US is considering allowing WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange to plead guilty to a misdemeanor offence to avoid extradition on espionage charges. Globalist agendas, democratic rights at risk, corruption, propaganda, it never stops. For the news and views silenced by the mainstream media, by government and corporations, vote one. TNT Radio. Free speech always has a home here. Stay up to date with the latest live news and current affairs delivered by our lineup of expert commentators and hosts. Listen to TNT Radio anywhere you go. Ask Alexa or Google to play TNT Radio or download the TNT Radio app for free from the App Store or Google Play. Today's news talk. This is TNT Radio. I'm just uh, here with Vanessa Beely. And one of the reasons I love talking with Vanessa is she separates fact from fiction, which is always welcome around here. And we were just talking in that brief break about how it is my observation that since October the 7th, the level of awareness and support for uh, Palestine seems to be unprecedented. And a couple of the examples that I mentioned to Vanessa was yesterday, for example, University of Bristol students, they use tables and chairs to barricade themselves into campus, campus building. It's a pro-Palestine protest. They say they will remain there until the institution ends its complicity in genocide. And then, of course, there was a protest last night at a London university because they brought in an Israeli soldier. So it seems like people are not having it, Vanessa. Is that is that what your acknowledging or noticing as well yeah i mean i think we've got two parallel streams running here first of all there's the british regime um, presentation of the narrative of a rise in extremism um, and then of course uh, this rise in awareness by people not only in the uk in the us um, in the eu across the world really um, now, my point would be that this is coming at huge sacrifice by the Palestinian people. Um, you know, official figures put uh, the number of deaths, 50% of which are children, since October the 7th at, uh, I think, around 32,000. I would argue that that is much, much higher because we know that the media massages and manipulates figures depending on whose side they're on in any particular conflict or who they're backing. So I would suggest that those numbers are probably double that with all the bodies under the rubble, with the people that have simply disappeared from inside Gaza, et cetera. Um, so, you know, if you imagine that since 1948, which was when really the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians began in earnest with the Nakba in 1948, which by the way, was also backed and organized by the British, it was a British general, Ord Wingate, who trained uh, the so-called Israeli Defense Forces in how to undermine society, how to basically assassinate community leaders, to, to weaken communities in villages and towns before um, driving them out and, and dispossessing them of their land and preventing their right of return, right? which is utterly disgusting. Anybody who declares themselves Jewish abroad in America or in Britain has the right now to settle on what was Palestinian lands, but Palestinians who were driven out of their own country don't have any right to return. Um, and so, you know, as I said, yes, this awakening, and it is, it's a tsunami of awakening and backlash against, not against Jews, it's a backlash against Zionism, which is in fact a, a secular, 
racist, supremacist, ethnic cleansing entity that has been responsible for continued ethnic cleansing since 1948. And that's what I'm saying. People were not um, responding in such a way to the previous 75 years of, let's say, trickle genocide. Now, because it's been intensified to such an extent, we can't ignore it. And the footage is literally being presented to us. Video footage, uh, testimony is being presented to us minute by minute, 24 seven. It's impossible to ignore it. And anyone who has a conscience, anyone who, who, who has any a degree of humanity has to respond to that and has to to be uh, against it. And of course, people now are starting to understand what Zionism means. You mentioned Bristol University, Professor David Miller, who uh, has just won his case where the, the university basically uh, sacked him on the basis that he was anti-Semitic. And what that case has now done, it, it, it has said, that it is legally viable to be against Zionism as a political movement. It's a very important, it's an unprecedented win for people that have been pushing back against what Zionism represents for decades. Um, so yeah, we are seeing a massive sea change in opinion, in the ability of people to push back against the narrative and even starting to look at the capture of UK sectors from health to cyber security. I urge people to look at the UK Israel 2030 roadmap. You will be horrified at the extent to which Israel will be collaborating on virtually every sector of British society. And it already is, by the way. That legal win is so vital, though, isn't it? Because yeah. obviously we've been lost in a mist for so long where there's been this conflation between if you criticise the Israeli government, then you must automatically be anti-Semitic, which in itself is anti-Semitic, surely. But I, I think that is just absolutely vital. But it's the information war that is sent because it was always a given that Israel was was like winning the information war because of their mm. allies, obviously, in legacy media. But it, it this pushback is literally, it's just incredible. Incredible. It's unprecedented because suddenly, as you say, the images are everywhere. We cannot ignore what is taking place now. It was very easy. And also one of the things that we've obviously also seen in this information war is how much the Zionists have lied about things. I think the baby story you remember at the beginning after October the 7th, which went all around the world, was promoted by people like Ben Shapiro as one example. And there was no credibility to that story. That was one perfect example. But that got destroyed, though, Vanessa, whereas that would have just continued unabated previously. Mm. Suddenly we've entered a new era where that, that's not happening. There are young people on TikTok who are looking at the Balfour Declaration. <laughs> you know, this is practically yeah. unheard of, isn't it? But 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 talk to me some more about that, because we've about the conflation of um, um, anti-Semitism and Zionism, because people have been caught in that. Political parties have been caught in that. Look what happened with Labour. Do you believe that what happened to Labour was just sort of um, was was manipulated and manufactured? Um, oh, absolutely. You mean the witch hunt uh, of Jeremy Jeremy Corbyn? Corbyn. And, yes. Uh, Chris Williamson and so on. Yes. yes, of course. I mean, I mean, there's considerable archived evidence of that that the Zionist lobby was working to basically bring him down. Right. Um, now, I do also think that Corbyn um, didn't take enough of a stand. He didn't uh, reject the IHRA um, uh, anti-Semitism uh, oh, yeah. you know, um, description, etc. He, to a degree, betrayed his colleague Chris Williamson um, over his anti-Zionist views, etc. So, but nevertheless, yes, there, there was definitely an orchestrated witch hunt. And, you know, you only have to look at, at the percentage of Labour Party and Conservative Party that are so-called friends of Israel. You're talking around 70 percent. And if you look at the fact that even Keir Starmer, his campaign, he received funding, I think it was 50,000 pounds from Trevor Chin, 
who is basically embedded in almost every pro-Zionist lobby operating inside the UK. He's on the executive committee of BICOM, um, the British Israeli Communications Centre that puts out briefs to the likes of the BBC and the British government on the situation even now uh, in Gaza. To give an example, um, the fourth attack on Al-Shifa hospital they made the claim, the, the Israeli Defense Forces made the claim, and this was basically channeled through BICOM to the British government, to the BBC, to the Guardian, etc., presumably, um, that the IDF was there to assassinate um, a senior Hamas leader. Who did they actually assassinate? They assassinated the head of the police force in Al Shifa, who was running humanitarian drops to northern Gaza, where the Israelis are deliberately starving. Uh, Palestinians and they shot him because what are they doing? They're destroying societal order just as they did in 1948 during the Nakba, right? But this is not talked about in British media. This, this complexity and context is never presented to audiences in British media and thank God people are now starting to go and look at the history for themselves. I mean, I think Peter sums this up, really. Vanessa has done great work in raising awareness of what is really going on in the Middle East. I've learned a huge amount from her discussions and interviews. And you have just been there. You've, you know, you've, you've been unrelenting, frankly, and thank goodness for you. And uh, Eleanor says, 100 percent Zionist thought and politics has created perhaps the most powerful level of destruction all over the world. That's quite a statement. I'm not sure. Do, do you agree with that? Absolutely. Um, the, the majority of Western media, legacy media, is owned uh, either entirely or in part by uh, Zionist sympathizers. As I said, if you look at British industry, we now have the UK Israel Tech Hub that was established about 10 years ago um, that is now basically capturing British industry and forcing it, not forcing it, but incentivizing it into collaboration with Israeli tech. And the majority right. of Israeli tech startups come from Unit 8200, which is a Zionist spy agency that has established, for example, the likes of the Hebron Smart City, um, completely invasive, intrusive surveillance systems, etc. And now that is being adopted into UK security, surveillance, cyber, healthcare. I mean, it's terrifying. Uh, Israel had the most aggressive vaccine policy, for example. Yes, indeed. Listen, Vanessa, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We truly appreciate your work, everybody. This is Vanessa Beely. She's a journalist and she has an attitude about Middle East injustice. <laughs> and clearly she doesn't Definitely. give a toss what anybody thinks about it. And so say all of us. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Take excellent care of yourself. We'll be right back. Thank you. From weather and traffic reports to news of political developments. We turn to journalists for the information we need to live our daily lives. Journalists around the world provide the news that is essential for democracy, for personal freedom, and for safety and stability. Yet their ability to report freely and safely is under attack like never before. So many journalists are paying with their lives. They faced exponential risks and they've already paid a heavy toll. Death threats, online harassment, and physical attacks are becoming a daily experience of journalists in all countries. We just want people to be safe, to be able to get our readers the information that they need to make informed decisions. They checked my phone and realized that it was Pegasus. I feel myself like I'm naked at the street. These charges were politicized from the start. Facts win. Truth wins. Justice wins. C'est énorme pour moi d'être là, d'être libre. Je que je m'y attendais pas du tout. Stand with the free press. Stand with journalists whose reporting won't be silenced. Press freedom is your freedom.
Last week, Brandon met a girl on a dating app. One day after work, he finally found the courage to ask her out. No answer. He started to panic. Was he being too pushy? Maybe it was too... Hey, sorry I didn't respond. I was driving. I would love to go on a date. How does tonight sound? Brandon tried to play it cool, but inside he knew. A girl so smart, so responsible. She must be a keeper. The conversation continues with Sonia Poulton on today's News Talk TNT. I think Vanessa Beely is tremendous. I know she takes a lot of flack. You should as a journalist. You, The point about being a journalist is you're not supposed to be a people pleaser or have people necessarily like you. You should just report the story and tell the truth. And I, I believe that she does that with uh, some serious aplomb, frankly. And talking about which, I'm uh, delighted to welcome in somebody who has, uh, well, first of all, I don't know about you, but I have a particular dislike of potholes. Yes, they damage cars tires. They're all around safety traps, frankly. My next guest not only is a significant campaigner against the problems with British roads, but he actually wrote an article for for France about the UK's obsession with potholes. Welcome, Mark Morell, also known as Mr. Pothole. Thank you for joining us this morning. Oh, good morning. Yeah, the media's give me that name, so I have to run with it. Oh, so so okay. So the media gave you that, and there's a very good reason why they gave that to you, Mark. You're probably the world's best known pothole campaigner. You founded National Pothole Day. Talk to us about that. I mean, the idea of that was uh, the frustration that uh, every uh, road user and the members of the public uh, were fed up. And I thought, well, I had a national day to point out that um, just how bad our roads are. Um, I started campaigning 11 years ago this month and, uh, you know, the roads have got worse and worse. I mean, I've had millions of pounds of resurfacing work carried out. I've issued legal notices on councils. Uh, I've had thousands of potholes repaired, uh, even as far away as America, because I've been tagged in on social media. Um, and now National Pothole Day has become well established and recognised uh, throughout. And uh, I have helped loads of people recently get their roads resurfaced by using part of the Highways Act uh, to put a legal notice against their councils. So I had two successes yesterday. You're, you're conducting a public service here, Mark. This is exactly what we need. You're doing the job of councils, frankly. And obviously on Tuesday, the annual alarm survey came out. It, it, it talks to us about carriageway maintenance as one example, the backlog of it. But one of the things that is is in that report, and I know that you've talked about, it, is the fact that our road network is largely 80 years old when really it should only last for 25 years. What has gone wrong? Yeah, it's decades of underinvestment by successive uh, governments and authorities. Uh, they've neglected it. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, the uh, UK road network, like the blood supply to our economy, there was a report back in 2010 that said that it was costing the UK economy £5 billion a year through badly maintained roads. Well, now we're 13 years on plus. Uh, and the cost of living, the cost of materials and cost of work's gone up. You know, we're probably 10, easy 10 billion pounds a year. It's costing the economy. So I can't understand why government won't commit to spending three billion pounds a year annually to resurface our roads, because that would then start making a difference. It might take, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. But if we don't start the journey, we're never going to get there. Well, this is interesting because there's also a further um, report that was out yesterday, which actually talks about how local councils are failing to actually spend the money that is available there to them to repair potholes. So let me just read some of these figures. The government created the Pothole Fund 2020. Each year until 2025, they would award 500 million to councils across England to enable them to fix an estimated 50 million potholes. This is why we're obsessed, because they're everywhere. But apparently they are failing to spend that. What is going on, Mark? Why are they failing to fill in these potholes? Well, I think that's where government uh, are good at sometimes. Daily. I mean, every year they dole out 
£250 million pounds and never audited with the councils where the money went. I think they need to be held accountable. I mean, that, that resurfacing money that I've mentioned, I would never just give it to them. I, I think they should actually produce a asset management plan and that should be audited each year. And unless you, unless you actually spend the money we are supposed to, you don't get the next tranche of cash to do your roads. It's not difficult. It's not rocket science. And you wouldn't need a massive team uh, to do so. And you don't have to do audits about ten percent of them, and uh, I think you pull them into line. So yeah, uh, pressures are on councils. I'm not their uh, biggest fan in terms of uh, when they work on the roads, what they could do, what they can't do. But they've got tremendous pressures with social care costs, How, and many of them rely on government-funded central money now. But at the end of the day, you know they have a legal responsibility to maintain our roads. Uh, and they're vital. I mean, if we don't do something about it, the report says that in 15 years' time, 53% of our roads will be structurally unsound. So does that mean we're shutting roads, they're unsafe right. to use? I mean, we're a G7 nation, and back in 2019, we were 37th in the world, where we've probably dropped down a number of places over the last two years. I know we're having some connection problems. I think I, I just heard the last part we said about the last two years. So this is so, so the point I think that uh, I just picked up there, you're talking about the fact that there's only 15 years structural life remaining in these roads. Of course, we are famous for our roads, our Roman roads. I was born in a part of the country that was famous for the Roman roads in Gloucestershire, as one example, beautifully straight. That that's uh, that was like the hallmark of them. And yet we seem to have slipped tremendously. What they're actually saying is in order to fix the backlog of carriageway repairs, they would have to increase it to a record 16.3 billion. Now, here's the thing, Mark, and I could be wrong here, but don't we pay road tax already? Oh, I don't know what we're... Yeah, but it's not road tax. It goes into central government. We've all referred to it as road tax. Right. But that is not for that is not for the actual road. Um, no, it goes into central government and they divvy it out. I think, like other countries, we should properly, properly have a road tax and it should be seen to be spent on our roads, not uh, into a central part, and they divvy out. I mean... Road users paying over fifty billion pounds a year from all forms of taxation, whether that be road uh, road fund license, uh, fuel uh, fuel duty, VAT on fuel duty, VAT on service repairs and major car. Because you know every time you pump uh, damage your wheel, they get twenty percent. Right. Um, I'm not sure if 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 uh, if the problems with the audio are too difficult to overcome. I'm hoping that everybody can actually hear what you're saying. But uh, also one of the things that you've said very clearly is we need an annual resurfacing programme over a 25 period, 25 year period. Would that really get rid of 95% of the potholes on our roads? Yes, because um, one of the problems with utilities failures is because the roads are not re resur being resurfaced, the, the, uh, the utilities trenches are staying there for, uh, you know, could stay there forever, you know, 80 years, whatever. Uh, and, and they're all areas which in the past, when they resurfaced, would be dealt with. We're not actually cleaning up uh, our roads at all uh, as a result of that. Um, so, yes, I strongly believe that that ought to be the answer, the only answer we've got. Uh, yeah, I think we've now completely lost you. Oh, this is fun, isn't it? The, po the point is, I think I think your work is tremendous, Mark. I think it's so important that you're raising awareness to this because it's an obsession with us Brits for a, a, a jolly good reason. And that is not only is it unsightly, but it is dangerous, it is costly to us. And this doesn't seem to be being addressed. How have they allowed it, though, to just fall into such a state of disrepair? And, and, and I'll give you an example. Example, I know somebody who recently won an award from their local council for £25,000 for them falling in the road into a pothole and breaking their leg, right? So this, th there must be all those manner of issues that are also going on as well. Are you aware of those? Yeah, yeah. I've mean, got a massive road back at that load. Carriage ways is 6 there's six billion backlog in bridge and uh, bridge maintenance structures. 
when you include footways, bridges, drainage, the whole of the infrastructure, we've got a £30 billion total road maintenance backlog that's not been addressed. And if you look at the uh, carriageway back, we by £2.2 billion in 12 months. I'm going to let you go there, Mark, because it's he's cutting off and I'm only getting half of what you're saying. But listen, thank you so much for joining us. We do truly appreciate it because we get the gist of what you're saying. Just a poor line. But never mind, everybody. This is Mark Morell. This is Mr. Pothole. And he is standing up and being counted, even with our dreadful pothole situation. Take good care of yourself, Mark. Thank you for joining us today. We do truly appreciate it. And I do apologise to everybody for the poor connection there. But sometimes that happens. Right. Let me take a look at uh, some of the news that is coming into us this morning. Let me just have a, a, a quick check on that. Um, and uh, let's see some of the things that I had picked up myself this morning. The sinister truth about vaping and why the habit loved by teens isn't as safe as you may think. I must bring a video to the show one day, and it's of me on the Alan Titchmarsh show about eight years ago, where I found myself in an argument with actress Joan Collins. And it's because I was saying um, there's something wrong with this vaping. The ingredients in these vapes include petrol. And I can't help but think this is not a safe alternative to smoking. And everybody was like, rubbish, you can tell by the sweet smells that these vapes give off that it's perfectly safe. This is a much more natural alternative <laughs> to smoking. Sure it is. Um, anyway, we're, we're getting one report after another, multiple studies now and now raising the alarm about the health risks attached to vaping and I'm really sorry to have to say that because I know many many people it is awful to be addicted to nicotine I was addicted to nicotine for 27 years and what I understood when I finally broke the habit I interviewed people who had been in rehab and were you know breaking the chains of hero heroin and a number of people said to me they found it easier to give up heroin than to give up um, nicotine. So it is really, really hard. And obviously the e-cigarettes, they appeared to be a brilliant alternative, but they were heavily marketed at children. It was absolutely obscene what happened. You you actually see 12-year-olds with vapes. And now, of course, we're seeing that there is a high probability and a link to cancer. Shocker. When I made my film, The Business of Cancer, I actually showed that we would we'd gone from the 70s to it being one in 20 people who would be diagnosed to ca with cancer to present day where one in two people will be diagnosed with cancer. And it's hardly a surprise, is it, when we are being sold things like vapes and we're told this is a safe alternative, this will help you kick the habit. And of course, it, it doesn't. I mean, it just simply doesn't. Now, look, I just want to say again, thank you so much to all of my wonderful guests for joining me today. Let's do a quick roundup on uh, any of the comments that are coming in on all of our various social media platforms. Thank you, Alan. I truly appreciate that calling me or it might be it might actually be Vanessa Beely because yeah that's true too fearless journalist indeed and uh, we will be back tomorrow of course on the Sonia Poulton show on today's news talk don't go anywhere I'm not sure if Johnny Vedmore will be rocking up with us today what are you saying in the comments there spoke to a chemical engineer last summer who explained the truth that these things are designed to destroy lungs and create illnesses deliberately hidden truth by a shower of bees um, and uh, I've stopped smoking three times for a year, but always end up here or can't explain it. I just run on nicotine. That I mean, the thing is, I have great sympathy for anybody caught in an addiction. It's absolutely miserable. And uh, Catherine always thought there was something dodgy about vape. So 100%. Um, oh, Stump Monkey. Um, already fixed one outside where we work. Tarmac guy often has tarmac left over at the end of the day. And uh, what else? What else have we got? Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Oh, glitchy. Can't hear him now. Yeah, well, that's why, unfortunately, we had to uh, curtail that conversation. It happens sometimes. It does. And uh, especially when you're live. So um, just to, as I say, um, a roundup of today, I'm going to go to some news headlines. We've got a couple more minutes to play with, which is a treat here, because generally we don't. Obviously, our guests often go right up to the hour. But, uh, oh, no, look, the first thing that hits me, this is really interesting, terrifying threat of underpopulation is laid bare as it's revealed how 75% 
of Western nations are facing baby bus by 2050 and will be left, in quotes, reliant on migrants, triggering staggering social change. That is interesting. Obviously, we've known for a very long time that the West are not producing as many babies as we are supposed to. Yes, of course, we're supposed to be baby machines. I mean, the reality is, whoever said that there was a perfect amount of people that should inhabit this earth. Oh, of course, it was the whole depopulation program. People like um, many people believe that the Georgia Guidestones, incidentally, when it said about, you know, living in, in perpetuity and living in perfect harmony with nature, they believe that the amount given there was what the sort of overlords had decided was the perfect amount of people that we should have living in this world. Well, I say that people should be able to have babies if they want and if they don't want. There's this this kind of force on us, you know what they do in China where they have a two baby limit? I just find that really obscene. It's like what has happened to our world where we have all of these people who keep telling us what we can and can't do. Have babies, don't have babies, right? Fall in love with your neighbour. Don't fall in love with your neighbour. We need more freedom. Hidden says, when they seek cures, we will give them more poison. Thank you, Teresa. We truly appreciate that. We always appreciate that. Thank you to everybody for being here today. All of my wonderful guests, we will, of course, be back tomorrow. It's Friday tomorrow, but stick around because TNT is where it's at. This is today's News Talk 24-7 independent programming, and you know it. Have a terrific day. Take excellent care of yourself.